Kommen wir zu unserem nächsten Preisträger, Andreas Hüttel. Andreas Hüttel wuchs in Ludwigshafen auf. Nach seinem Studium und der Promotion an der LMU München ging Andreas Hüttel 2006 an die TU Delft, wo er erste bahnbrechende Experimente zur Nanomechanik von Kohlenstoff-Nanoröhren durchführte. Danach kehrte er nach Deutschland zurück und wurde 2010 Leiter einer emi gruppe an der Universität Regensburg. Seit 2020 hat er eine Gastprofessur an der Alto University in Helsinki inne und Andreas Hüttel ist nicht nur ein exzellenter Forscher, sondern er hat auch stets seine Kamera dabei und ist ein exzellenter Fotograf. Wenn Sie es mir erlauben, Herr Hüttel, dann würde ich mal ein paar wenige Bilder ähm, aus Ihrer Webseite, die ich geklaut habe, also man kann die auch, vielleicht sei das an dieser Stelle ähm, erwähnt, man kann die auch käuflich erwerben, dann bekommt man sie auch in ähm, guter Auflösung und ich habe die jetzt extra nur in schlechter Auflösung per Screenshot geklaut, damit Sie vielleicht einfach mal so ein, zwei Eindrücke ähm, davon sehen. Und Sie dürfen dann nachher sagen, vielleicht liege ich auch falsch, aber wenn ich der Webseite das richtig ernommen habe, ist das in Soul. Das Nächste ist in Regensburg mit zu viel Wasser bei Hochwasser. Nochmal in Regensburg, jetzt mit äh, besseren Wasserverhältnissen. Und entsprechend auch des Werdegangs noch in Delft ein Foto. Also da gibt es ähm, ganz viele schöne Bibliotheken. Lohnt sich wirklich, ein, ähm, einen Blick da reinzuwerfen. Trotzdem bekommt Andreas Hüttel heute keinen Best Picture Award, den er sicher verdient hätte, sondern er bekommt den Walter Schottky-Preis. Und der Walter Schottky-Preis dient der Auszeichnung einer in den letzten beiden Jahren auf dem Gebiet der Festkörperforschung veröffentlichten hervorragenden Arbeit eines oder mehrerer jungen Physikerinnen bzw. Physiker. Welcome back from the break. And the next prize winner is Andreas Hütte, and he actually shares the same university with me. After his studies and PhD at the Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich, he continued his research in the Netherlands in Delft. Then he worked on the nanomechanics of carbon nanotubes. As we already saw from the pictures, he cannot only take pictures of the nanoscopic world, but also of the macroscopic world, and is a passionate photographer besides his day job as a researcher. Today, he is awarded the Walter Schottky Prize, honoring the excellent work in the field of solid-state research as a young scientist. Ja, wir, wir sehen, wir sind also wirklich international. Es begann äh, mit Berlin, das ging über München, dann hatten wir Kopenhagen, jetzt sind wir in Helsinki und ich glaube, es geht jetzt im Laufe der Veranstaltung noch, äh, noch weiter. Gleichwohl ähm, äh, sind wir, äh, obwohl wir in, in Helsinki sind, mit, äh, mit Herrn Hüttel äh, auf der deutschen Seite, deswegen meine Laudatio, äh, die Kurzlaudatio auf Deutsch. Andreas Hüttel ist ein Experte auf dem Gebiet des Quantentransports in Nanostrukturen. Durch die Integration von ultrareinen, freitragenden Kohlenstoffen Nanoröhren in supraleitenden äh, äh, Mikrowellenschaltkreisen konnte er deren nanomechanische Vibration an Quantenzuständen einzelner Elektronen auf dem Resonator äh, koppeln. Dies eröffnet neue Möglichkeiten in der Verschränkung von mechanischen, elektronischen und photonischen Freiheitsgraden. Ich freue mich also, Herrn Hüttel den Walter-Schottke-Preis 2021 überreichen zu dürfen und würde Sie auf die Bühne bitten. Ja, lieber Herr Hüttel, ich muss die Urkunde vorlesen, sorry. Die Deutsche Physikalische Gesellschaft verleiht den von der Infineon 
von der Infineon Technologies AG, der Osram GmbH äh, sowie der Robert Bosch GmbH unterstützen. Walter Schottki Preis für Festkörperforschung des Jahres 2021 an Herrn Dr. Andreas Hüttel, Universität Regensburg und äh, Alto äh, Univer University Espo, Espo äh, in Finnland. Für seine, äh, her, äh, für seine herausragende Leistung zur Quantenkontrolle in der Nanoelektromechanik. In einem bahnbrechenden Experiment ist es ihm gelungen, die starke Kopplung eines freitragenden Nanoröhren-Quantenpunkts an einen Mikrowellenresonator nachzuweisen. Bad Honnef im Juni 2022, Deutsche Physikalische Gesellschaft. Gratulation. Herr Achso, ich denke, ja. auch Ihnen versprechen Sie, bekommen Sie wieder. Ja. <lacht> Ja, herzlichen Dank. Es ist äh, mir eine große Ehre äh, mit dem Schottke-Preis und ein großes Vergnügen, Ihnen jetzt hier ein bisschen etwas über meine Arbeit zu erzählen. Ich äh, bin in der Zwischenzeit nicht mehr in äh, Finnland, sondern wieder an der Universität Regensburg zurück, diesmal mit einem Heisenberg-Stipendium. Äh, und ja. As you can see, I'm going to switch to English uh, because uh, the uh, uh, topic is carbon nanotubes, perfect hybrid elements uh, bridging quantum electronics and nanomechanics. No? Okay, yeah. So in the meantime, we have looked at many different topics uh, within uh, the nanomechanical and nanoelectronic world in, in Regensburg, ranging from superconducting hybrid structures to single electron nanomechanics uh, to gigahertz readout, what I'm going to tell you about now, um, but also at novel materials, uh, let's see. Uh, There is no time here to tell you about all this, so I'm going to focus and give you a little bit of an introduction. Um, why are we interested in carbon nanotubes? What's great about them? Well, um, first of all, they are uh, extraordinary mechanical elements. Uh, they're stiffer than steel, they are resistant to damage from physical forces, and they are very light. Uh, and so they are material of engineering dreams, uh, but also excellent nanoelectromechanical systems. So now we don't have a space elevator yet. Uh, what we do have instead is, uh, well, very modern uh, ski, for example. Or if you consider a mobster career, you could also have a stylish suit that is very light, but actually bulletproof. Uh, um, the second side is electronics. Uh, everybody nowadays knows graphene, so everybody knows these graphene Dirac cones as the dispersion relation of graphene. And what is a nanotube but a wrapped up uh, sheet of graphene? Now, if you talk to a theorist what kind of uh, boundary conditions he prefers, the likelihood is high that you hear periodic. Uh, uh, and this is a case where you get naturally periodic boundary conditions for just about everything, the electronic wave function. Uh, so the Uh, graphene dispersion relation is restricted to one dimension. Uh, and you get, depending on what carbon nanotube you precisely choose, uh, either semi semiconducting ones when you miss the direct points or metallic ones when you hit the direct points. Uh, semiconducting ones become great transistor elements. Metallic ones become excellent conductors. And they can be grown, suspended, clean, unperturbed, meaning that you get an amazing quantum mechanical model system. Uh, in, the technical, in the technological world, uh, by now, uh, research has really uh, gone on into integration. So you can see here an amazing nature paper from two years ago, or three years by now, um, where a microprocessor was built from carbon nanotube transistors. And that's a processor that is actually complex enough so it could in principle run Linux. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the metallic side, nanotubes are now used in, well, 
I'm not sure if this number is actually current anymore, but uh, some time ago I heard they are built into 40% of all mobile phone batteries. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Now we are looking at the properties of single nanotubes. Uh, so what we do is nanofabrication to integrate these nanotubes into chips and then low temperature measurements uh, where we cool down our chips to temperatures somewhere on the, uh, in the range of 10 millikelvin uh, to measure their electronic transport properties. Then we can look at the properties of a single macromolecule in high detail. What's special then? Well, first of all, uh, the mechanics becomes uh, quite extraordinary then. You can actually show the mechanical resonance of such a string, similar to what we've just seen here, um, very easily in a low temperature experiment. You just hang an antenna on top, irradiate with a radio frequency field, and if you hit the right frequency, then suddenly you see a huge spike in the current for your system. Uh, you can zoom in, uh, you can uh, fit it, you see that it has a very high uh, resonance frequency in the megahertz re regime, but also a very high mechanical quality factor, up to uh, millions by now. Uh, imagine if a piano had a quality factor of a million, then you would hit the key and 10 minutes later you would still hear it. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a highly controllable, but very stable system. and Also a fantastic sensor for all sorts of forces, charge, mass, force, electric field, uh, uh, you name it, you can sense it in principle. Mm. To give an impression how this works, uh, well, you all know how you change the resonance frequency of a mechanical system, uh, especially of your guitar or piano. You, you shouldn't do this yourself with your piano, but at least with the guitar, you can uh, turn this knob and change the frequency. Yeah, and in this case, we can just apply a static voltage. Uh, oops, sorry, uh, how to get back. In this case, we can just apply a static voltage. And then we have uh, a force between one side of a capacitor and the other side of a capacitor uh, that's pulling, it's increasing the mechanical tension and thereby increasing the resonance frequency. And you can see in this big measurement here uh, how it increases from somewhere around 120 megahertz to somewhere around 400. Um, so this is really a very strong mechanical effect. How strong we will even see later. Mm -hmm. On the electronic side, uh, well, there I have to give a little bit of an introduction for those who are not familiar with the field. Mm -hmm. There's one phenomenon that is very central for these devices at low temperatures, and that is called Coulomb blockade. Basically, the idea is you have a tiny uh, nano object that is connected to leads. And this nano object is, uh, well, essentially a tiny capacitor. Now, if you want to send a current through it, well, the smallest current that you can send is one electron goes in, one electron goes out again. But if the temperature is too low, uh, then no current can flow because you need energy to charge a capacitor. And if the thermal energy is smaller than this charging energy for one electron, that's not possible. Um, and this phenomenon is called Coulomb blockade. Uh, you can well sketch this as such a ladder. Each of the lines here corresponds to adding one electron to the system. With an additional gate electrode, you can shift this line here up and down. And only when one of the uh, ladder ranks here hits the Fermi edge of the leads, only then one electron can tunnel in from the leads to a free state on the quantum dot and tunnel off again to a free state at the Fermi edge. And if you plot the conductance now as function of this gate voltage, you get these so-called Coulomb blockade oscillations of conductance. At each peak, the electron number can fluctuate by one, uh, in between, the electron number is fixed and the system is isolating. Yeah, this here is a sketch. This was done with Mathematica by feeding it one of the uh, appropriate formulas. Um, in reality, this looks like this here. Uh, so you can see it's even more beautiful. Uh, 
but it's also more complex because uh, we have here, for example, a semiconducting nanotube. So we have a band gap, we have hole conduction, we have electron conduction, and there are patterns in here that correspond to the quantum mechanical shell structure, uh, something that I haven't told you about yet. Mm. Yeah, and um, without going into too much details, now I'm actually skipping a few steps here. Uh, using such conductance resonances or similar conductance resonance, you can now do real transport spectroscopy on the electrons trapped in such a potential well um, by looking, for example, at uh, the dispersion of conductance lines in a magnetic field. Uh, you can identify what uh, quantum states these lines correspond to. And this here is a very nice example because it's the spectrum, the excitation spectrum of one single electron in the conduction band, where you can identify the ground state, the excited states uh, in the magnetic field. Yeah, so far so good. Now I've told you about mechanics and I've told you about electronics. But it gets finally exciting when we combine the two. Uh, Let's combine electronics and mechanics. And I've shown you this experiment where we tuned the uh, mechanical resonance frequency with the gate electrode. Uh, now we are going to zoom in a lot there and look at the details. Mm. And this is a picture that we actually never published anywhere. Somehow we never got around uh, to it, uh, but still it's a very nice measurement because what you can see here is uh, the mechanical resonance uh, for the region where you add the first, the second, the third, and so on electron to uh, such a nanotube. Mm -hmm. From the theory, uh, you can identify that the structure looks like this here. So you have a combination of a slope, of a step, and of dips. And you have to remember we are tuning the frequency via uh, the mechanical tension in the system. Uh, so the slope, corresponds to charging the gate electrode, uh, and thereby pulling stronger. The steps correspond to the discrete elementary charges that are added to the nanotube. Uh, and the dips, they are a little bit more complicated. They correspond to switching of the system between, uh, well, uh, isolating and conductive, or more precisely between constant charge and increasing charge. Let's not go into this detail right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so here we have a system that is clearly very strongly coupled and combines this electronics and mechanics in surprising ways. And from there we can start to speculate. What could we do with this? Um, let's imagine we can cool a carbon nanotube in its electronic and mechanical ground state. Uh, and let's imagine we can then uh, control it coherently via DC and gigahertz signals. We have a very long-lived mechanical mode that could store information, for example, as a memory. We have a switchable coupling uh, to all sorts of other degrees of freedom. So we could translate information between degrees of freedom, uh, motion, spin, charge, photons. So we have some sort of a switchboard here, an interface between maybe different solid space qubit implementations. Apart from that, in such a system, many more additional uh, uh, fascinating experiments then become possible. You could, for example, look at the impact of uh, known excited quantum states on the vibrons. As you can see, this is a, as you have seen, this is a very well characterized electronic system. Of course, if you have a system in the ground state, it's kind of, providing the ultimate sensor resolution, and many more. Well, yes, there's one challenge, however. And the challenge is that right now, in the experiments that I've shown you, we are still far from the quantum limit. The mechanical resonance frequency is somewhere around 100 megahertz. The temperature in the cryostat is somewhere around 10 millikelvin. So if we just take these two numbers, then we have an excellent low thermal occupation, and that's great. Uh -huh. However, the experiments that I've shown, they detect uh, the motion uh, by driving resonantly. 
And of course, then uh, you are not in the thermal occupation anymore. Uh, you can calculate the, the occupation of the vibration mode, and then you end up somewhere around a, a thousand or so, at least. Um, we want to keep our high mechanical resonance frequency because of uh, because it makes the quantum effects easier to see, uh, and that makes then a direct readout uh, somewhat tricky. So we need for the detection and the module and the manipulation in the quantum limit, we need a new approach. And uh, for this, we've gone to people who've done it in other material systems, and we've gone to the people of optomechanics, microwave optomechanics to be precise. So you've maybe already seen this picture. I've stolen it shamelessly from the review of Marcus Aspelmeyer. Um, optomechanics is a very popular area of research where uh, systems that are very different in structure uh, are, uh, well, used from the gram range suspended macroscopic mirrors, even gravitational wave observatory elements uh, down to cold atoms in a cavity from the gram to the septogram. And this is something that many research groups worldwide are working on. The general idea is in many of these experiments the same. And this is kind of the prototypical optomechanical system. We have a laser cavity and one of the mirrors is mounted on a vibrating beam. And so you have an optical harmonic oscillator and a me mechanical harmonic oscillator that are coupled in a specific way. And the coupling can be described with this interaction Hamiltonian. Now, optical frequencies are for us out of the question because uh, one photon is enough to kick our electrons out of the potentials. Uh, so that's way too much high energy physics. Um, so we need to go to microwaves. Uh, luckily, uh, this here is 100% equivalent to this here. Uh, so if we have a LC circuit for microwaves and a capacitor in there that is uh, changing its capacitance with the position, then we can do the same experiments. You can see that this cavity capacitance directly enters here the formula for the main parameter uh, that describes the coupling, this uh, optomechanical coupling constant. Okay, so let's do this experiment. This is how it looks like. Uh, we have a microwave resonator, that's this uh, snake here, uh, basically a coplanar strip line with an interruption here and an interruption here, and you get a standing wave in there same as in the tubes or in uh, the macromechanical experiments that we've already seen. And uh, yeah, then we want to build a nanotube next to it. And that's what these areas here are for. Uh, if you look there in detail, you see contacts and a central electrode. And on these contacts, we then deposit the carbon nanotube. We grow it on one of these tuning forks, and then we touch it down and uh, deposit it here on the electrodes. So far, so good. Uh, now this problem is a matter of scales um, because um, most optomechanical experiments focus on large systems. Now here we want to couple to a tiny system. And you'll see here, this is the length of the coplanar resonator. This is the length of our nanotube segment. And this is the typical deflection scale. So from the geometry alone, this looks horrible. Uh, you shouldn't see any coupling. Well, we did the experiment. Uh, this is kind of a slide for the experts, but it basically just shows them we are also cooking with water. Uh, it's a typical low temperature transmission uh, setup. Um, and if we then do a specific type of experiment, the so-called OMID experiment, we see clearly that there is an interaction. And we can fit this and we get the coupling constant that is actually huge. So these 100 Hertz doesn't sound huge, but it's actually a factor of, uh, it's four orders of magnitude larger than you would expect uh, from the geometry, from these estimates from the scales. So obviously the model was too simple. Uh -huh. 
And now comes the side with the most formulas. Mm. The point is that the nanotube is not a metallic beam. The point is that it has these Coulomb blockade oscillations. Uh, so the capacitance that uh, the microwave sees, it changes strongly when you change uh, the gate voltage. And there's an amplification factor in coming in because of these nonlinear effects. And that can go up to 10 to the power of four in our experiment, can in future experiments become even larger. We can verify that this is really the effect by looking at uh, the gate voltage dependence and tuning across one of the Coulomb oscillations. And so this here should be one Coulomb oscillation. This here is the coupling factor for each point. And as you can see, this fits just great. We, for, the, for the optomechanics experts, we can give some numbers. I don't know how many optomechanics experts are here. The coupling now is very interesting. Why is it very interesting? Because uh, we are within reach, we are not there yet, but we are within reach of several, um, well, quite useful parameter regimes. Strong optomechanical coupling, where you have a hybridization of the mechanical and the radiation mode, and the so-called quantum coherent limit, uh, where you can switch an energy quantum between photon and phonon faster than the thermal decoherence. Both is not reached yet, but should be reachable with realistic improvements. And that's what we are working on now. Right now, we have two projects in the Heisenberg uh, uh, program. One is quantum materials. I haven't told you about this. This is a completely different topic. Uh, the other one is quantum devices. This is the continuation of this work. Um, the work wouldn't have been possible without uh, uh, our, co our collaborators and the members of my research group. Uh, in particular, Stefan Blin was the PhD student who was the first author of the paper. Um, and with that, I'm coming to the end. I would like to thank the prize committee and the DPG once more uh, for the Walter Schottky Prize. It's been a big honor. and. Uh, I would, I would like to thank you for your attention.